you're more likely to see advertising from fast food companies. They want to take the money where they can get it, but the cost of that is consumers of their products actually being bombarded with these messages from these unhealthy companies. Hello, I'm Bonnie Urbay. Welcome to To The Contrary. This week, veganism in the black community. We speak with award-winning nutritionist and best-selling author, Tracy McWhorter. Her newest book is called Ageless Vegan, The Secret to Living a Long and Healthy Plant-Based Life, written with her mother, Mary. So welcome, Tracy. Great to have you here. Thank you, Bonnie. Great to be here. So whose idea was this book, yours or your mother's? It was mine. It was my idea. My mother was reluctant um, because she's like, who wants to hear my story? But, um, you know, she's a black woman who started, who's from the South, who went vegan in her 50s and is now 83 and doing great, still vegan. So I wanted to share her story. And how did you become vegan? I became vegan 32 years ago as a sophomore at Amherst College. Our black student union brought Dick Gregory to campus and uh, to talk about the state of black America and instead he talked about the plate of black America and how unhealthfully most folks eat and he traced the path of a hamburger from a cow on a factory farm through the slaughterhouse process to a fast food restaurant to a clogged artery to a heart attack and that's what started me on my journey. Yeah, he, he was an incredible leader in, in yeah. many respects, right? but also that respect. Do you think, given that heart disease is the biggest killer mm -hmm. in this country, bigger than all cancers combined, right. um, do you think Americans have gotten the message that connects animal fat with heart disease? It's improving. I mean, I think more and more people are getting the message, but clearly not enough. We're dealing with marketing, food advertising. We're dealing with um, a USDA and food guidelines that are biased towards, you know, industry, towards the food industry, not necessarily um, promoting health, um, but promoting the food industry, right? That's their job. And so we have this contradiction there. The message is getting out more and more. I mean, I see the difference in the last 32 years from when I started, um, but um, you know, there's more to be done. Tell me about the differences, if they exist, between mm -hmm. diff between white people and communities of color, different communities of color, and vegetarian or veganism. Uh, the last poll we have is from 2016 that breaks down veganism and vegetarianism by race. And um, so as of 2016, 3% or nearly 1.5 million African Americans are vegan and vegetarian, and another 32% say that when they eat out, they regularly or sometimes order meatless meals. So that's an additional 15 million people. African Americans are pioneers in veganism. I mean, starting from the late 1800s, African Americans who were Seventh-day Adventists um, were eating vegetarian food on up through uh, the civil rights movement because of the practice of nonviolence, many folks actually expanded that nonviolence towards uh, animals. And that's how Dick Gregory became uh, a vegetarian, starting in 1965 and then vegan in 1967. So when he came to my campus 20 years later, he was he had been vegan for 20 years. You know, there's always been this what I call a stream of African Americans who have been into veganism and healthy eating next to this big river or ocean of folks, you know, who were not, but you know, that number is improving. So in terms of the need for African Americans to eat more plant-based foods, whether it's, you know, more or all the way going vegan, um, it's to me, essential because we have the worst health outcomes in the country. There are about 300,000 African American deaths from primarily chronic diseases, preventable diet related chronic diseases every year. That's more than 800 people a day. Um, and so this is a real crisis in our community. And there are lots of reasons that people are eating unhealthy foods, but we also have the power to take back control of our health.
We've done over the last 28 years mm -hmm. lots of stories about African American health and African American men's health, and, mm. which is worse than African American women's health. And I've often thought that it must be associated, dying of heart attacks at young ages, must be associated with, um, with eating a lot of animal fat and hardening of the arteries, et cetera. Is that accurate? Yes, definitely. I mean, it's the number heart disease. Um, it's the number one cause of death among African Americans as well. Um, There's certain cancers, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, um, uterine cancer. There's stroke. There's unhealthy weight, obesity. There's diabetes. Um, and there's also oxidative stress, right? So oxidative stress can be caused by diet. It's, it's kind of rusting of the cells prematurely. That can be caused by diet, but that can also be caused by racism and sexism, right? External by stress. factors. Right. By stress. Absolutely. And so these are, because of this, to me, it is even more imperative for us to take back control of our health um, as much as possible um, while we are addressing these societal injustices, while we're being activists out here. We need to, to really uh, embrace more self-care. And, you know, the biggest thing that we can do is to eat more healthfully, more plant-based foods. But a lot of what you've said is also true of the white community or yes. not so much the Asian community. They tend to eat more, better, I think, than just about ed any other ethnic group in this country, including whites. Well, you know what's really interesting about that too, Bonnie, is that before fast food companies began to target African American communities, urban areas, African Americans were actually meeting the uh, USDA recommendations for fiber, for healthy fats, for whole grains, for fruits and vegetables, more than white Americans were. So this is in the 1960s. And then the fast food companies decided um, to target and, and actually prey on low-income communities of color, particularly African American communities, starting in the early 1970s. And that completely changed the way that um, low-income black folks in cities were eating. I was, it's funny because I was going to ask you whether mm -hmm. fast food was a factor in, um, yeah. in African Americans eating, you know, having these problems. And uh, have, you done, have you tried to do any work with these companies? To, I mean, you always see McDonald's yeah. sp sponsoring McDonald, Ronald McDonald houses in yeah. the low-income areas. Yeah. You see them targeting them and, and Coke and Pepsi, yeah. uh, targeting black communities with ads, mm -hmm. with ads yeah. during sporting events that attract African Americans mm -hmm. more so. Um, what can be, you know, have you had discussions with them about knocking this off? It's a hard question for a lot of organizations and companies, uh, school systems, because they're underfunded, right? And so, and they're not getting the same um, uh, funding that primarily white organizations or institutions might get. And so, and, and in terms of African American media, they want to take the money where they can get it, but the cost of that is um, African American consumers of their products actually being bombarded with these messages from these unhealthy companies. Yeah. Well, but Um, what's positive is, is that you actually have policymakers, you have people in political power who themselves are vegan or vegan friendly who are initiating these kinds of, um, these kinds of things. So for example, in New York, um, they have just instituted meatless Mondays, right? So starting actually this month. So all public schools across the city will have meatless Mondays. You have, um, uh, the Coalition of Healthy School Food, for which I'm an advisory board member, they have actually helped some charter schools and in, in, um, communities in Harlem is one of them, actually have regular vegetarian meals. So you have these, you know, these uh, politicians, you have organizations that are trying to do the right thing. 
um, but it's not on a kind of legislative level yet. According to a 2016 poll by the Pew Organization, some 9% of Americans will say that they are vegetarian, almost uh, vegetarian, vegetarian, or vegan or almost vegan combined. Mm -hmm. That still seems low to me when I see the huge increase of vegetarian and vegan restaurants across the country, uh, some even becoming chains like, mm -hmm. um, not, not sweet green, which is healthy food, but not Veggie vegetarian. Veggie grill is an example. Right, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So you said 32% of African Americans, if you include an occasional Right. vegetarian meal or right. vegan meal. Right, so these restaurants that you're seeing um, more of, they are actually catering to vegans and vegetarians, but primarily to omnivores, right? That's why you're seeing more. So just like a third of African Americans are ordering meatless meals, you know, when regularly or sometimes, so is the general population. How important are things like books like your book, which I wanna talk about in a couple of minutes, and your pamphlet, um, and documentaries mm. about the food industry. I remember when I was still eating pretty much all dairy products, um, somebody told me about the, there was a documentary out about dairy products and that they mixed, the, I don't remember what it was, but I think it was something, it showed how the dairy industry would mix um, germs, germs that came out of the cows that didn't get out through pasteurization or mm. fats that mm -hmm. contain germs mm -hmm. back in with, with the, the milk, milk before when they processed it mm. and all the awful mm -hmm. things that mm -hmm. and I realized hey I gotta quit this stuff too yeah um, but how important are those things in converting people oh crucial they're absolutely crucial because you you understand we know that there's a concerted effort by Junk, the junk food industry, the fast food industry, the processed food industry through food advertising to keep customers, to, to target young people, to get them hooked very young. And so we need books and we need guides and we need um, movies. We need documentaries to counter this message because it's not coming from the federal government enough. Um, it's not coming from, you know, even healthier food industries. You rarely see commercials that promote fruits and vegetables and whole grains, right? Um, so these other types of media are crucial um, to helping people, um, you know, understand about veganism and vegetarianism. Let's switch to what you've written. Sure. So this is the book, um, my latest book, Ageless Vegan, that I wrote with my mom. And um, this actually was written in celebration of our 30 years of, go, of being vegan. Um, and this guide is the African-American Vegan Starter Guide that I created with Farm Sanctuary. And this is a completely free guide I wrote with 11 other black vegan experts. And it's all about how and why to go vegan. You, you said earlier something, there are tons of vegetarian and vegan cookbooks coming out yes, all the time. All right, the talk time. about that, please. Just kind of start with um, the basics, ingredients, um, fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, whole grains, beans, and nuts as ingredients, right? And so how do you use those in and seasonings and sauces? And so what I'd like to do if I'm doing a cooking class um, or if I'm at a festival, is start with vegan soul food. Now, most folks eat soul food at family reunions or special occasions. It's not everyday food, right? But that's the food that you're gonna have at a festival or a right. celebration, right? And so uh, I show folks how to make it using um, plant-based ingredients. So how do you make mac and cheese? Um, how do you make collard greens without meat? Tastes delicious, right? How do you do faux fried chicken? Um, so that's what I start with, and it's in, um, and I think that once people understand that they can make easily make these foods that they love, that they like to celebrate with at home, you know, they start there. What do you tell people about making, about using processed mm -hmm. vegan products yeah, that truly question. aren't as healthy as if you start from scratch yourself, right? Because they yeah. have sugar and salt and. And fat. Yeah, absolutely. So I call it bridge foods. These foods out here that, that mimic um, burgers and hot dogs and cheese, 
um, and chicken, those are highly processed and more likely to have to be very high in fat, salt, and sugar. So they are healthier, but they're not necessarily healthy um, because they're still processed and so and they're still addictive. A lot of people need that bridge. They need to have foods that taste um, and feel in their mouth like uh, meat and dairy, right? So, and I did that 30 years ago, right? I needed that kind of food to get me over the hump. But it's, so it's a bridge, but it's not a place to stay. The same you're saying uh, as a bridge, calling a bridge food is, is meat that doesn't, may have originally come from animals in the, in the case of, for example, lab made meat, but right. doesn't involve cruelty in its production. Right. The bridge foods in these lab based uh, meats um, are absolutely better when it comes to animals, right? Um, but when it comes to health, for these um, lab-grown meats, you are still dealing with um, animal protein, cholesterol, and saturated fat. Now, what uh, reason do most people cite for becoming vegetarian and vegan if they grew up yeah. on an animal-based diet? Most people do it for health reasons. That has been my experience over the decades. But actually now, because of climate change, um, and because of people's awareness about animals, I actually can't say that that's really true. I, I would like to see what, what the latest statistics are myself. If you're really informed about what's going on, you know that the burning of the Amazon uh, is happening because they're clearing land for cattle grazing, right? For raising meat. Well, lumber too. Yeah, and lumber, and cl and also for um, to plant soy, right? Mm -hmm. That's fed to animals. But I think <laughs> it's more known. You're right in that it's better known as being done to to get precious woods and rare woods, but it's less known, and more people need to know no, about more the fact people need to know. that a lot of it's being done to raise cattle. Exactly, and and environmental organizations are now willing to say it. I think decades earlier they were less likely to make the connection because they were afraid of losing funding. But now, I think that they're more, they're more willing, from what I see, they're more willing to make that connection. And so we're more likely going to hear it in the media. I think for health reasons, for animal rights reasons, and for, for climate reasons, that people do it for spiritual reasons as well. Right, I was gonna yeah. ask you, how does religion play into all this? Because I was noticing, I was doing research in mm -hmm. advance, advance of our right interview, here. and the most vegetarian, or vegan country in the world is India, where 75 percent, and mm -hmm. of course Hinduism right. um, and Jainism, yep. two prominent uh, religions there, mm -hmm. do not allow their followers to eat meat. Right, and here um, in this country, and also worldwide, Seventh Day Adventists right um, promote a vegetarian diet, and. Um, you know, I think that the largest study done here on African Americans was on African American Seventh Day Adventists. And something I learned preparing for this interview um, was that Oakwood uh, College in Alabama, which is a black Seventh Day Adventist institution, has always had vegetarian food since its founding founding in the in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. So. Um, you know, definitely religious and spiritual reasons. And here in, in Washington, D.C., in the 80s, when I went vegan, um, I discovered myself that there was a large and thriving black vegan community that had started the very first 100 percent vegan establishments in the nation's capital. And they were African uh, Hebrew Israelites, um, a Sarah Set. From Ethiopia? Um, no, no, they, they were, were actually, actually African American. Because right. the black Jews in Africa are from right. Ethiopia. They themselves, they themselves were from this area, mm -hmm. and they adopted mm -hmm. this practice, this okay. religious practice. Um, and there was also uh, a Sarah Set. Um, so, um, and then the Nation of Islam, you know, promoted vegetarianism as well. And then you just had folks who were doing it for animal rights and social justice reasons, right? Same as, as uh, Dick Gregory. Um, so there are lots of reasons that, you know, that folks do it, but definitely religious and spiritual reasons too. Um, now, one question I want to ask is the expense. Mm -hmm. Vegetarian and supposedly is a more expensive way to go, but meat is more expensive than vegetables. Yeah. So how does all that work? <laughs> so, 
it's a myth that um, it has to be, that it's by default more expensive. It obviously can be, right? Um, but if you're cooking your foods from scratch, um, and if you are using whole food ingredients, if you're getting rice and other grains from the bulk bin, right? Um, if you're making your stir fry, for example, if you're, if you're a family that eats chicken stir fry a couple times a week, you can substitute chickpeas or tofu um, or black beans or cashews or walnuts, right? Much cheaper than um, throwing some meat in there. So it doesn't have to be if you know how to cook from scratch. And I think that um, that's a time issue, right? Less than, uh, more so than an expense issue. It's convenience, right? That people are, um, that people are stopping at fast food places after the kids get out of school or after, you know, they're picking them up from soccer practice or whatever. Um, and, um, you know, they don't have time to cook. That's an, that's an issue to address, right? Um, but it doesn't have to be more expensive. And in fact, that thriving black vegan community that I mentioned in the 80s that had these 100% vegan establishments, they were in low-income black communities. One question I get from everybody about being vegetarian uh, and them thinking about it is, well, where am I going to get my protein? Oh, not the protein question. <laughs> <laughs> so vegans get 70% more protein than the recommended daily allowance, just like omnivores do. So. Protein is a non-issue. I read somewhere that you need, uh, every person only needs two ounces of protein every day. That's not a lot. You don't no. need a, a 10 ounce steak. You don't need, you know, a 15 ounce fish. You need two ounces. Exactly. So, um, mm -hmm. and what I tell people is, you got nuts, yeah, you got right. soy, if you want... You get 10% got... of your protein needs from all kinds of whole grains. Even fruit and vegetables have protein in small amounts. It's really difficult not to get enough protein if you're eating a healthy vegan diet. It's just not an issue. Fiber is. Fiber okay, is and where do issue. you get your fiber from? You get just your so fiber people know. from plant-based foods. All okay. of those plant-based foods that we talked about, the beans, the nuts, the whole grains, the fruits and the vegetables. You don't get fiber from processed grains, refined grains. You don't get fiber from meat. So it's a lack of fiber that is the real issue. Where do you get your fiber is the question that we should be asking. Six area, topic areas I wanted to cover. Okay. The first is the history of the food industry. Mm. Why do we have such a poison-filled food industry in this country? Yeah. Why, you know, I, I guess preservatives, I guess sugar, I guess fats, but I even, I feed birds outside my window. Mm -hmm. They put suet, which is beef rendering, into bird, wild bird food. Birds don't eat cows. <laughs> I mean, what happened in this country where some, some person now that I've had gone into wild birds food stores and said, why in God's name would you put beef in food for a bird? Right. Um, and they say, well, it gives them more energy. They like it better. I mean, it's profit. You know, it's the food industry is, it's, you know, we're in a capitalist system that is about exploitation, extraction, and getting folks addicted to a product, right? That holds up, holds true in the food industry. It's the same thing. The industry puts profit over people, profit over health. And the United States Department of Agriculture's job is to promote the agricultural industry. And so what that means is you have um, subsidies that go to these huge industries, these huge fast food uh, companies, these huge agricultural companies to subsidize the true cost of these products, right? So that's why these foods are cheaper. The ingredients, the inputs are subsidized. And so it makes it seem that the cost is cheaper, but we're actually paying for it in terms of our health. It's not, you know, it's, this is what it is. So it's up to us to, uh, to challenge that and to organize around that to make changes in the industry. It's not going to happen from the corporations. It's happening. It's going to happen from us. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your wonderful books and the information that you're spreading and, 
and all Thank best you. of luck to you in your career moving forward. Thank you. It was great talking to you, Bonnie. That's it for this edition of To the Contrary. Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week. for To the Contrary, provided by the Cornell Douglas Foundation, committed to encouraging stewardship of the environment, land conservation, watershed protection, and eliminating harmful chemicals. Additional funding provided by the Wallace Genetic Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more PBS.